Um, good afternoon, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I would want to recognize and establish the protocol. Um, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, my mother, Ajia Aminaji Mohammed, the UN Peace Ambassador, Malala Yousafzai, my boss, of course, <laughs> the resident coordinator, Mr. Matthias Schimmel, our lovely father, the co-founder of Malala Fund, Mr. Ziauddin, our board member, and of course, the most supportive board member I've seen working with, Pearl, you're welcome. My godmother role model, Mrs. Suraki, you're welcome. Um, Mrs. B.C. Fayemi, my other boss from the island, <laughs> you're welcome. Mrs. Kemi, welcome to uh, the speech. Um, of course, I recognize the RPC, our prof, uh, you're welcome. Um, many other persons I see in the room, if I'm going to establish one by one, I think we're going to miss everyone, but then heads of UN agencies that are here present, UN women, I see you and uh, other, others, all, all others present. Apologies if I skip you, but you are in my heart. On behalf of Malala Fund, I would want to welcome you to Malala's birthday. Today is her birthday and... She is celebrating her birthday with us in Nigeria, of course. This is really a milestone for women and girls in Nigeria and we're most proud of. Uh, today is also her 10th anniversary speaking to the United Nations in 2013. She did to call the global leaders to commit to education and ensure that they provide free, safe and quality education for all girls around the world. In Nigeria, Malala Fund has invested in education in millions of dollars. And again, we've been influencing through policies, through technical support and capacity development, as well as establishing partnerships with national organizations, but also individual activists and girls themselves. Happy birthday, dear Malala, for turning 26 today. And thank you for dedicating so many years of your life to ensure that girls have access to quality of education around the world. I want to especially welcome the DSG who has graced us with her time throughout yesterday, going with us from one visit to another, ensuring that she's not only mentoring us, but creating access and opportunities for young girls in Nigeria, but also around the world. The DSG has been an inspiration to many of us, myself an example, but also she has been a mother to me and a friend you can always count on. Uh, so um, thank you, Ma, for your hard work. And you are really an evidence that education and educated girls can make a difference throughout the world. I welcome you all and I hope you enjoy your stay with us here and uh, thank you for coming. I would want to call on the DSG Ma to give us your own speech, thank you. Thank you so much, Fatima, and make us very, very proud. So, Excellencies, um, our distinguished guests, special welcome to Mr. Yusuf Azai, who is a teacher beyond teachers. <laughs> Dear friends, and I can see many in the room, uh, young people, what an honor it is for me to welcome Malala to Nigeria, real honor. She may not be from here, but it really does feel like a homecoming. And I can tell you that as we visited the vice president who knows probably more about Malala and says it in every word that he speaks about all the way to her family, her village, her school, um, you really began to feel that yes, Malala is one of us. I consider Malala not just as a daughter because I probably put it given birth to her, <laughs> um, but also as a sister. And, and, and I'll say as uh, some of my friends would, when you, when you really do and are inspired by a young person, you'll say, I wanna be like you when I grow up. <laughs> and I know that I'm not alone in this room as you all look at her. Malala has transcended borders, cultures, generations, and her message and her passion have touched people the world over. I'll never forget 10 years ago when she was 
in the UN, a young girl who rose to the podium at the UN and declared to the world in the strongest of voices, I have to, do, to tell you, and really clear. And she said that one child, one teacher, one book, one pen can change the world. Uh, you should have been there. And I think that it's um, no mean statement to say that the palpable electricity in the room could have powered all of Nigeria at the time. But what's more important is that Malala has lived those words every day. And I saw that in ben, uh, Borno State yesterday. We went to um, Meduguri. It's not the first time that she's been there. But if you see the progress and the first time she was there, and the leadership that we've seen from civil society, from women, from the governors, the two governors, now one a vice president. It has been amazing. Um, and it has been through the work of her foundation. The not just to Borno, but many visits around the world, her powerful and eloquent advocacy for quality education for every girl. But she's also talked about the boys because we are about equality. Malala and the UN know that this is not a wish. It's not a dream, but it's a fundamental human right and we must all make it right for everyone and real for everyone in their lives, leaving no one behind. Leaders at every level have to heed Malala's words and back that up with investments in education. And they need to do that now, or if we were to say yesterday would have been good. But it's especially for the 129 million girls that are not enrolled in school today. And for all those that are striving to overcome the barriers to quality and safe education and all forms of discrimination including the brave girls of Nigeria. So dear friends, this young voice in the mountains of Pakistan has dared us to imagine. When her country, her faith, her gender was under attack, she inspired us with compassion and with courage. Just think of the Malala story. And I will tell you that she often says to us, this is not just my story, it's every girl's story. But I don't know many that were shot on their way to school and left for dead deliberately because they stood up for education. And by some miracle, and we all know that the Almighty had a purpose for her, she recovered. And when she was asked what she said to the shooter, she replied with another miracle. She said she would tell her would-be killer, I want education for your children as well. Malala keeps daring us to imagine, to imagine a world with less intolerance, more understanding and respect, a world less hate and more humanity, a world of less bigotry and more equality, a world of less ignorance and more education and knowledge. Malala was perhaps the most famous student in the world. And she has gone on to teach all of us, Nobel Peace Prize winner, a UN messenger of peace, a torchbearer for the Sustainable Development Goals, a sister, a daughter, inspiration. Malala, welcome home. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Excellencies, sisters, and brothers. 10 years ago, on this day, I was 16 years old and visiting the United Nations headquarters for the first time. The Secretary General had invited me to tell my story to an audience of 500 young people. At that moment, I could not have imagined being here with you today. I did not even know if I would live to see another decade. I spent two years of my childhood under the terrorism of the Taliban, displaced from my home and banned from going to school because I was a girl. I was shot and nearly killed for speaking out against these injustices. I did not know if my first I did not know if my first speech at the UN would be my last, my only chance to ask the world to send every girl to school. I'm more than happy to say that I was wrong. Over the last 10 years, I finished high school and graduated from university. I traveled to 31 countries. 
I started Malala Fund to support education activists and amplify girls' voices. I gave a lot of speeches and talked to many leaders. In everything that I did, I tried to draw the world's attention to girls like me. The nearly 120 million girls denied the right to education by poverty, patriarchy, climate, and conflict. In the years following that first speech, I spent my birthday traveling to meet girls around the world. Refugees in Jordan, Iraq, Kenya, and Rwanda. Indigenous girls in Brazil, and activists and young women in Nigeria. On my three trips to this country, I have traveled from Abuja to Medaguri. I have listened to the heartbreaking stories from fathers and mothers who lost their daughters in the Chibok school kidnapping. I have asked two Nigerian presidents and other officials to do everything they can to ensure children are safe at school. Seven years ago, I met Amina, a student from Kaduna State. She told me she hoped to go to university and become a teacher. But she knew the challenges ahead of her. She was one of the only girls in her community still in school at 17. She spent her evenings tutoring friends who had dropped out. Amina recently graduated from college with a degree in biology education. and took her first job as an educator. I'm thrilled that Amina is here with me today, and I hope you will all congratulate her for her work teaching the next generation of girls. I know many girls like Amina. In the refugee camp in Jordan, I met Mozun, a 16-year-old Syrian who refused to give up hope for a better future. Last year, she completed her master's degree in international relations and she hopes to become a journalist. In the United States, I met Mary Claire, who first stepped into a classroom at the age of 11 after her family fled conflict in Congo, having witnessed so much violence, including the death of her mother. She wanted to learn how to heal her community. Today, she is an intensive care nurse. We should celebrate the girl who goes to university, takes a job, chooses when, who, and if she marries. But we should not deceive ourselves into thinking that we have made enough progress. I want to cheer for those who have made it despite the challenges they faced, but my heart aches for those who we failed. Every young woman like me have friends we saw being left behind, girls, whose governments, communities, and families held them back. Just as these individual stories show us successes and setbacks, our work to advance girls' education globally has seen major wins and obstacles in the last decade. In 2015, we raised the global standard for education from nine years to 12 years, ensuring that SDG4 would match the ambitions girls have for themselves. In 2018, the G7 committed nearly $3 billion to increase education opportunities for girls affected by emergencies and conflict. And just last year, 14 African countries signed the Freetown Manifesto to promote gender equality in and through education. I'm grateful to these achievements and the advocates, governments, and UN partners who made them possible. And I'm proud of the Malala Fund's work in supporting girls and activists leading the call for change. But this handful of victories can't hide how little has changed for hundreds of millions of girls. And now we are facing new challenges. As COVID-19 forced children out of school, Education experts knew that it would take a coordinated, focused effort to make sure girls return to the classroom as soon as possible. Yet many countries reduce their spending or aid to education. And many low and middle income countries have to choose between paying their debts or paying for education. Across Sub-Saharan Africa, the number of out of school girls has increased since the pandemic. 
10 years ago, millions of Afghan girls were going to school. One in three young women were enrolled into university. And now Afghanistan is the only country in the world to ban girls and women from seeking education. Even as a teenager, I understood that progress could be slow, but I never expected to witness a complete reversal, an entire country of girls locked out of school, trapped in their homes and losing hope. When you look at me or Amina or Mozoon or Mary Claire, don't see us as success stories. Instead, imagine what our world could be if every girl in Afghanistan, every girl in Nigeria, every girl in Pakistan, every girl in every country had the education and opportunities they deserve. I dreamed of that world a decade ago. I stood on the stage of the United Nations and with a 16 year old's optimism declared that one child, one teacher, one book and one pen can change the world. But I will tell you today what I did not know then. One child, even with the best resources and encouragement, one child can't change the world. Neither can one president or prime minister, one teacher, one activist, one parent. No one can change the world on their own. What is true is that change can begin with just one person. And to begin and to build a world where every child has access to 12 years of quality education, we must join forces. We must bring girls and governments together with activists and educators, parents and community leaders. I have seen what can happen when people work together for education and equality. In nine countries, Malala Fund supports local education champions who are lawyers, teachers, coders, and activists. Working together, Malala Fund champions in Nigeria convinced governors in Kaduna and Adamawa states to ratify the Child's Rights Act. In Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, Pakistan, they successfully advocated for 70% of the province's education budget to be dedicated to girls. And we see stories like these replicated in countries around the world. We should follow the lead of education champions and young leaders who understand the power of collective action. And we can begin with, and we can begin with what we have already been promised by holding our leaders accountable for the commitments they so quickly abandon. We must ask those who claim to care about gender equality and education why their budgets and policies do not match their words. We must call again and again every opportunity for leaders to prioritize education. We must also look beyond governments to our own communities. I believe that so many of the problems girls face would be solved if we could break the stranglehold of patriarchy, the misogyny we disguise as culture, tradition, or religion. We need fathers like mine who stand up for their daughter's rights. We need mothers who speak up for them and brothers who celebrate their wins. We need imams and priests who speak out against those who twist our faith to hold women and girls back. We need a community of people who do not tolerate any harm or discrimination against girls and protect their equal rights. And each of us must begin at home by challenging our own thoughts and by starting conversations with family members and friends. As I have often said, culture is made by people and people can change it too. I am thinking about my friends today, about Shazia and Kainat, who were also injured when I was attacked. They're completing their training to be nurses and they remain committed to advocating for girls' education.
I am thinking of a friend who did not have a choice in her marriage and had to give up on her ambitions to become a teacher. I'm thinking of a friend who is my age and dreams of becoming a doctor, but has to beg her family's permission to step outside her home. I'm thinking of all my friends who are denied the opportunities they deserve, who face misogyny and violence, who are constantly told they're not enough, but who push forward toward their goals despite the challenges. At 16 years old, I couldn't imagine what the next decade would look like. I couldn't think what it would hold for myself or girls like me. But I was hopeful because I saw the world waking up to the injustices we faced. Today, I can see the future more clearly because I have met our future leaders. Girls understand the power of education and they're working to open the school gates wide enough for every child to enter. I know that if we match their determination, fund their work and follow their lead, we will see so much progress in the next 10 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Malala, for continuing to share your story with us and continue to demand that girls have access to free and college education and at least their individual rights that they deserve to function as uh, individuals. I would want to call on Tammy Lore. Tammy Lore is part of our girls fellowship program and she's going to share with us the reflection of what Malala just shared with us and welcome Tammy Lore. Thank you for the introduction, Fatima. Um, I am honored to speak at this event here today. My name is Tamilore Omojola. I'm a university student from Nigeria and an advocate for girls' education. Through my work as a Malala Fund Fellow, I fight for every girl's right to learn in my community and around the world. I live in Ibadan and where I live, Parents don't always give daughters the same opportunities as sons, but that wasn't the case in my family. My mother treated me and my younger brothers equally. The classroom equipped me with the knowledge and tools I need to achieve my dreams of working with girls and young women in my community. But around the world, millions of girls are not as lucky. And that is why I am here today. Over the last decade, young women are speaking more than ever before for their right to learn. And organizations like Malala Fund are uniting girls and prov providing unwavering support and empowering platforms for them to lead the change they want to see. Notable progress has been made to advance girls' education, but so much more is needed to get all girls in school. With a unified voice, girls everywhere are demanding that those responsible for the commitments made so far towards girls' education are held accountable. We must not fail any more girls, whether as a government, community, or as individuals. As Malala aptly stated, no one can change the world on their own. There is no doubt that the individuals gathered in this room as well as those in our communities, possess the power and determination to foster the change that we would like to see in the next decade. Let us create a future where girls have unrestricted access to free, secure, and quality education. Let our future 
begin with an action you take today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tammy Lore, and thank you to all our girls present in the room. Thank you, our dear champions, for the work that you continue to champion in Nigeria. I see many of our partners as well present, and thank you to everyone who had made it to the speech today. I would again sincerely thank the UN for hosting us, uh, Mr. Arsi. We are really grateful, and we hope to continue this partnership as established. Thank you to Deputy Secretary General for being so gracious and hosting us and paving the ways and continuing to champion young women's agenda, but also girls. Um, to this, uh, we have come to the close of today and we're happy to continue to mingle while we exit the building. Thank you so much.